Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content. And we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our mini series, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. What a treat for our listeners. That's right. So with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get all episodes ad free. That's the whole back catalog plus future episodes. And twice monthly, there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions. So people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders. And uh, you get a whole lot of more of Paul, America's PCP. <laughs> you know, Paul, ever since my son started swallowing money, I've noticed some real change in him. (laughs) I I like that one, okay. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Watto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Tonight, a show about dysphagia, dysphagia, you be the judge. We have a great guest, Dr. Diana Snyder. And Paul, how are you doing? I'm I'm great, Matt. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm good. It's it's been a month since we recorded. I feel like I forgot how to do this. Yeah. (laughs) I think think you did very well tonight, Paul. Um, (laughs) Thanks, Paul. The audience is in for a real treat, but would you tell them what is it that we do on the show and can you introduce our wonderful co-host? Sure. Happy to, as always, Matt. As a reminder, we are the internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you alluded to, we are joined by your fave in mind, uh, Dr. Elena Gibson, who uh, is also the writer and producer for this episode. Dr. Gibson, how are you? I'm lovely. How are you? <laughs> Good. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm going to leave the space open for you to tell us about who we talked to and maybe even a little bit about what we talked about. Yeah, happy to. So tonight we have a conversation with Dr. Diana Snyder. Uh, Dr. Snyder is currently an assistant professor at of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She attended medical school in residency at Loyola, and she was chosen as a chief medical resident there as well. She completed her gastroenterology fellowship at Mayo Clinic, Arizona, where she was also a chief fellow, and she was the first Mayo Clinic Arizona Advanced Esophageal Disorders Fellow. She Her research is focused on esophageal disorders, including motility disorders and eosinophilic esophagitis. She is principal investigator for multiple EOE clinical trials and has completed several high-impact studies evaluating opioid-induced esophageal dysfunction as well. So in this episode, we talk about quite a few things, including how to differentiate esophageal and oropharyngeal dysphagia, uh, when to think about eosinophilic esophagitis, which is more common than we think, and then what to do as far as next steps in evaluating dysphagia, including EGD or additional imaging. So let's get to it. And before that, a reminder, this and most episodes are available for CME credit through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. Diana, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, back by popular demand, we are going to, we, we wanted to know uh, a one-liner, like tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a hobby or interest you had outside of medicine. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me today. Um, So I'll have to tell you, my favorite hobby is actually going on hikes and walks with my husband, but as well with my adorable Cavapoo puppy. I have a one-year-old dog, Duke, who's very uh, spunky and adorable and looks like a little teddy bear, but he also likes to go hiking with us. So that's how I decompress from the hospital. Fantastic. Fully support that. That is, we get a lot of hiking answers, Paul, and I... I don't hike, Paul. Do you hike? I don't hike or garden, no? so I am. I remain poorly adjusted. Uh-uh. Paul, I, I challenge you with your upcoming move that you need to start doing both of those things, <laughs> okay. or at least one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I think one's going to be more of an option than the other, but we can talk about it later. <laughs> All right. Well, did you have any questions for our wonderful guest? Sure. I'll, I'll ask my usual. I, I am almost caught up in some of the pop culture I want to be caught up with, but I do wonder if there is like a TV show or book or a piece of music that you would recommend that you think our listeners might enjoy. 
Yeah, there's actually one I just started watching. It's called The Lost Kitchen. It's on a few different streaming services, but it's really interesting. It's this uh, self-taught chef, Erin French, who's from this very small town in Maine, but she developed her own farm-to-table restaurant. So she goes to all the small farmers and, and basically shows you how she learns to find the best produce or fish or whatever entity it is, and then brings it to a restaurant and goes through the steps of building farm to table meals. It's very soothing and another kind of nice thing to do after a long day and taking care of patients. <laughs> this sounds very much my jam as someone who only watches Food Network and the cooking channel. So this is <laughs> yeah. exactly this is exactly yes, this, the thing I'm I've been doing watching too. on HBO Max is what it's on right now. It may be on other things too, but it's great. And there's three seasons to catch up on so you can binge it oh, too. Uh, stellar perfect. recommendation. <laughs> Elena, how about you? Any any questions for our guests before we start getting into some cases here? Yeah. Could you tell us, you know, some meaningful advice or feedback you've received during your career or training? Yeah. One of the most important pieces I received was actually from my esophageal mentor from fellowship, who is also my program director for my extra esophageal fellowship. And we were doing our last meeting before I was going on staff. And he said, Diana, it's really important that you pay it forward all of the mentorship, research mentorship, sponsorship, all of these privileges that we gave you, you need to send it down to the trainees that are working with you. That's the one thing I ask of you. If you do that, we'll be proud of you. So it's really important to to pay it forward to your trainees. Nice. Yeah. And here you are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So good. Good example. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's a great transition to uh, let's let's pay it forward by helping us through a case from Cashlack. And Elena, if you would if you would start us off. Our first case is Quinn, a 28 year old with six months of trouble swallowing associated with intermittent chest pain and feeling like some food is getting stuck. She has a past medical history of hypothyroidism on levothyroxine, and she takes some daily loratadine for allergic rhinitis. So before we get into the details of Quinn's case, can you review the definitions of some of the common terminology? So dysphagia, odynophagia, and globus sensation. I'm really glad you asked about this because often there can be overlap and it's difficult to distinguish. So it's important to define this. So dysphagia itself is really the subjective sensation that a patient has that something isn't moving from the oropharynx into the stomach, whether it's solids, liquids, pills, saliva, whatever it is. A dinophagia, though, is when you're having pain when you're swallowing. So that's pretty distinct. What gets a little trickier to delineate is globus. So globus is really when the patient tells you something's sitting in the throat or there's a lump in the throat. And how I distinguish it from dysphagia is typically when they're actually actively swallowing, globus gets better. It's something they notice more at rest. So if they're swallowing, it gets better. It's probably less likely dysphagia and more globus related. That is a simple but very important distinction. It's better with swallowing. I I think I could remember that. So I I think you get so many complaints in primary care about people uh, having swallowing difficulty. When I was reading about a lot of the causes of dysphagia, it seems like there's like a delay in diagnosis uh, for that, for people getting an actual diagnosis, is is that you think that's because we don't know how to take a good history for when someone comes in complaining of dysphagia? And can you tell us how you go about that? So it's not that we're bad at taking histories. I think a lot of it's our situation, right? We have limited time, so we do the best mm-hmm. we can with limited time to ask the detailed questions. But the biggest issue we see with diagnostic delay is actually with eosinophilic esophagitis. That's very common. The incidence and prevalence are going up even beyond us doing more endoscopies on patients. And a lot of that is because of compensatory mechanisms. So a patient that has had difficulty swallowing solids basically since childhood practically with EOE learns how to drink a lot of liquids, learns how to be the last one to leave the table, choose well, eat slowly. And so often they don't even realize that they're different than everyone else sitting with them because they're so used to compensating. So we really have to tease out some of those details in order to figure out what's going on. I feel like I would, uh, well, I know I would get tripped up by this case too. I think based on age alone, and then you gave what looks like maybe some post-nasal drip in there. Like, I think I would anchor pretty hard on the globus. I'd be chasing down heartburn maybe, or trying to diagnose this poor patient with an anxiety disorder they don't have too. So I can see some diagnostic delay just based on Patients looking overall benign too. 
Yes, especially as you point out, younger patients that are pretty healthy overall. The big trigger to me actually was seeing that in the case there was allergic rhinitis. So I do like to hear about other allergic conditions or atopic conditions. So patients who have atopic dermatitis or eczema or asthma or even asthma as a child that now is in remission or allergic rhinitis, there is quite a bit of overlap for that with esophageal disorders like EOE. So we've kind of heard about her um, past medical history and what would make you concerned there. Do you find it helpful to ask things like pointing to where people feel like food is getting stuck or whether or not they're having any vomiting, kind of other questions you might ask to try to figure out what the next best step for evaluation would be? Yes, I do ask them to point, but there are caveats to that. So the neural pathways in the esophagus cross over extensively. So sometimes I'll have a patient that points right to the suprasternal notch, and actually the issue is a Schottsky ring in the, at the lower esophageal sphincter. So it doesn't always correlate, but if they do point up high more to the throat area or the suprasternal notch there, then I will ask further questions to try to delineate, is this oral pharyngeal dysphagia versus esophageal? And that's when I start asking things like, is there nasal regurgitation? Do you see liquid coming out of your nose? Are you coughing or choking when you start the swallow? Do your family and friends tell you you have bad breath? Or do you notice a foul odor? Or sometimes do you wake up and find some food on your pillow? So it's important to ask some of those things that trigger me to more oral pharyngeal dysphagia because pointing to the higher part of the chest or neck alone doesn't tell me if it's esophageal or not. And then, as you mentioned, other associated symptoms are important. So before I go through the uh, associated symptoms, I also ask about what types of items they're having dysphagia with. Is it solid foods? Is it the trickiest solids like dry bread? Is it meat, rice? Those are usually more difficult. Is it softer solids like oatmeal? Are there issues with liquids? Because liquids are important to ask about. When solids progress to liquids, then we're more worried about things like malignant causes. When solids and liquid dysphagia is occurring simultaneously, we start worrying about motility issues. And then also, are they having difficulty with pills? Often, pills are challenging. We're really not designed to swallow pills. That's a human invention, right? So those are very challenging. So I do ask about that as well. And then with the associated symptoms, once I further delineate the actual dysphagia component, I like to ask about alarm symptoms. So I do ask about weight loss, as we do for many areas of internal medicine, right? Are we worried about something more alarming like a malignancy? Is there bleeding? Are they having aspiration pneumonia? Those are the big alarms or vomiting. And then after that, I like to ask about common associated things. So it's important to remember erosive reflux alone can give a patient dysphagia, even without a peptic stricture there or a Schottsky ring. So it's important to ask, are you having heartburn? Are you getting sour liquid regurgitation up to your throat? Also, it can overlap with dysphagia and rumination. I realize I see a bit more of that because I'm a subspecialist, but I, I think it'll even come to your internal medicine clinics where a patient will be swallowing food and thinking they're having dysphagia, but really, oh, it's just effortless. The undigested food comes back up and they're re-swallowing and don't realize they're not nauseated. They're not retching. They're just ruminating. So I do try to ask about that too. And then the other thing, uh, what I mentioned before, is I do ask about all those EOE compensatory mechanisms and atopic overlap, because that's another common thing not to miss. And faithful listeners will know I'm the guy who just asks like the most basic questions, just because I want to make sure I'm understanding stuff. But you, you'd mentioned sort of differentiating oropharyngeal versus esophageal dysphagia. I wonder if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute just to make sure that I understand the, t the terms exactly what you mean when you say those things. Like what, if you can just sort of talk about what goes into each of those, because I feel like that would be helpful in terms of thinking about pathologies too. So when I talk about oral pharyngeal dysphagia, I mean everything above the upper esophageal sphincter. So once you're below the sphincter, the top muscle of the esophagus, then we're talking about esophageal dysphagia. So oral pharyngeal dysphagia has numerous buckets. You think about the common structural problems like ENT issues. Is it a cricopharyngeal hypertrophy or bar? Is it an older patient that has that plus a Zanker's pseudodiverticulum or outpouching there where the bar is? Um, or is it more of a neurologic problem? Do you have someone that had a stroke or has Parkinson's disease? Um, so I think of those areas within the, the mouth and throat and pharynx, whereas everything else below the upper esophageal sphincter is esophageal. And so you, you already told us we, we can't necessarily um, assume it's upper if they're just pointing to that upper throat. We can 
ask those type of questions, but uh, it's it's not a hundred percent, which is a shame. Because Paul, we we're always looking for that just like <laughs> that one thing. Just make it yep. easy for me. Just tell me what yes to do. No. I wish. <laughs> I wish. What to do. Yeah. <laughs> for a simple a simple pipe system or a simple bag of you know muscle, the esophagus, the neural pathways are actually super complicated. So sadly, right. we can't just point. I wish it would be a lot. Make yeah. my job easier and yours. <laughs> And there's a lot, there's a lot that can go wrong here. So, um, I, I guess we, why don't we read the next part of the case, Elena, and then we can, we, we can ask some follow-up questions. Sure. Yeah. So Quinn, uh, describes a progressively worsening sensation of solid food getting stuck around her sternal notch. Uh, symptoms do improve whenever she drinks liquids. Uh, they did not change when she was started on a PPI trial three months prior to the current appointment. Uh, so the PPI was discontinued. So thinking about what we now know about Quinn and her history, how would you determine what the next best step for evaluating Quinn's dysphagia would be? Uh, and within that, which, which patients should be evaluated within EGD versus barium esophagram or a modified barium swallow? So really almost any patient with progressive dysphagia, including Quinn, as she's described with that here, really warrants an upper endoscopy because dysphagia alone is considered an alarm symptom, right? That requires endoscopy. The caveats to that would be certain other clinical comorbidities that would limit someone to undergo moderate sedation or monitored anesthesia care. So as long as the person is healthy enough to undergo the procedure and in the dysphagia is progressive, they should really get an endoscopy. So what to do in terms of imaging studies? So there's not a lot of guidelines on what to do with esophagrams and modified barium swallow. So for run-of-the-mill solid food dysphagia, technically you don't have to do those. You could just go right to endoscopy. We use them quite often, of course, because as an esophageal specialist, we like to have that roadmap because sometimes we're seeing complex strictures and things where it's nice to have that delinea on the esophagram before going in with an endoscopy. So, but generally speaking, the modified barium, or which is really a video fluoroscopic swallow study, that's really for those patients I mentioned earlier where we're thinking there's an oropharyngeal problem going on, meaning they're having the coughing, the choking, the liquid regurgitation out of their nose, the halitosis. Those are the ones where we need to do the video swallow. The esophagram is looking more at the body of the esophagus and relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. It can also look at the mucosal lining of the esophagus, whether there's a diverticula, whether there's a stricture, whether there's a ring or a web. And really, a low threshold to order an esophagram, it can be done at every hospital, it's cheap, and it's not harmful to the patient. So, And there are some patients where maybe you're worried about starting with an endoscopy because of some of those anesthesia risks, but being able to do an esophagram that's not invasive is a good starting point. There are specific things that we look for in addition to those general principles. And there are patients that, you know, I see a lot of patients with achalasia, and that's always something we learn as a med student. But there are specified barium protocols we use for that, where they actually give the patient a a huge 200 milliliter bolus of barium, and then they measure the column up from the lower esophageal sphincter to wherever in the mid to higher esophagus it, it flows and how high that column measures at five minutes. And that's really important for us to see before and after we treat achalasia and watch that column go down. The other thing we use is we have a special EOE protocol where our radiologist knows how to put the patient in different positions and measure the max and minimum diameter of the esophagus so that we can track strictures because even esophageal specialists like us can miss strictures endoscopically that are subtle, and we can pick them up on esophagram and then know to look for them and target them for treatment during an endoscopy. I wanted to just recap a little bit about the barium. So you said the modified barium or the video fluoroscopy, that's really for, if we're thinking pharyngeal, like Mm -hmm. oropharyngeal dysphagia, and those are the patients you said, like the nasal regurgitation, they're choking, aspiration, pneumonia, bad breath, that, those people. Yep. And then the esophagram, uh, which is often not the first study for dysphagia, but it's it can be a good study. Maybe if you already know someone has a problem and you're looking, you said use it as like a roadmap. That was an interesting um, way to look at it and that there's all these various protocols that can help for specific diseases. So yep. that's something that I didn't know about at all. And we were, we were talking about this ahead of time that 
sometimes I'm waiting three months for someone to see GI for an EGD. So I'll end up getting the barium swallow, even though if you look at a lot of algorithms, it seems like it's always the, not the first line test. I'm often getting it just um, while I'm waiting uh, sometimes, yeah. d- depending on the situation. I like that strategy because you can rule out some larger malignancies and significant stricturing disease that would prompt if they're found to get an expedited consult. So that I like mm-hmm. that strategy. That's a good way to do it. So for for our patient here, you said you would be looking for an EGD for her. Um, and you gave us a little bit of the differential already, but I guess can you tell us like what would you be what would you be thinking as you are uh, you know, as you're approaching this, like what would you be looking for and what would be done on the EGD to try to help figure out that what, what it is in the differential? So when we're talking about esophageal dysphagia, there's a lot of buckets of things we can think about. So in this case, it was progressive solid food dysphagia and progressive solid food dysphagia or even intermittent solid food dysphagia in a young person is EOE until proven otherwise, because it's so prevalent. So you really need to do the endoscopy to look for that. But the other buckets of things, so we think about inflammatory conditions. So those are going to be things like EOE or erosive esophagitis and reflux or pill esophagitis. Then we think about primary motility issues. And again, cue that more for patients that are having solid and liquid dysphagia. And the classic primary one we think about is achalasia. There's a lot of other nuances to those motility disorders. And if it's not achalasia, trying to delineate those, you can always talk to a specialist like us. And then there's the secondary motility problem. So those those are patients who have other conditions like autoimmune conditions like scleroderma. They get absent distal peristalsis and motility problems. And then finally, we think of the usual structural or mechanical issues like peptic stricture, Schottsky ring, those types of etiologies. So those are the big buckets. But here, young person, solid food dysphagia, EOE is differential diagnosis one, two, and three. <laughs> I was going to ask what you made of the strategy um of the trial of a PPI, even in the absence of like overt reflux symptoms, is that something that would be reasonable to do in a patient like this? Or is that you're just wasting time and they should be scoped to be looked at? Yeah. Progressive dysphagia, I would not waste time on a PPI trial. It was re- it would be reasonable to do it after the endoscopy. So do the endoscopy, you see endoscopic features of EOE, you get confirmation on the histology, and we can talk more about that if you want to as well. Um, and a PPI trial to treat EOE would be very reasonable. Roughly 40 to 50% of patients are histologic responders to proton pump inhibitors for EOE. So it's, we're not just treating reflux. We're treating EOE directly. Proton pump inhibitors work on the EOE is basically a TH2 mediated, uh, immune reaction. And so there's certain factors in their eotaxin-3 that the PPIs directly target. So they're not just treating reflux overlap in EOE. They're directly treating EOE just in that flip of a coin percentage of a population. PPI trials are okay when you're dealing with someone who's presenting with heartburn, regurgitation, classic reflux symptoms, no alarm symptoms, no dysphagia, no weight loss. That's reasonable to trial for eight weeks. Progressive dysphagia, you need to go to some kind of endoscopy or imaging. We have this broad differential and you mentioned achalasia and EOE. You told us this ahead of time. Can you tell people the prevalence of EOE compared to achalasia just in general? Yeah. Yeah. So EOE is one of the most prevalent conditions we have. So now it's up to one in a thousand or one in 2000 patients, which is a huge magnitude compared to the prevalence of achalasia, which is one in a hundred thousand. So achalasia is much rare. It's, it's that classic thing we learn. You have to learn the bird's beak on the esophagram as a med student, right? But EOE is what you're going to see a lot in clinic. Yeah. You know, when people have this non-cardiac chest pain, I'm like, could this be distal esophageal spasm? Because sometimes it just feels like people are, they're kind of describing, oh, it felt like my, something was spasming in my chest. And I'm like, but it seems like that is also pretty uncommon especially compared to something like EOE or just like a peptic stricture or something like that. Mm -hmm. So when a patient comes to me with chest pain, I always tell them, I say, I'm an esophagus specialist. You know, I love the esophagus, but the heart always comes first. The heart is important, right? So I'm always sending them to cardiology or their primary (laughs) to make sure they get the EKG or the stress or whatever they need. As you mentioned, this is non-cardiac chest pain. So that already happened, which is good. 
That should happen before they come to me, but sometimes it doesn't. So once I think it's non-cardiac, then we really have to delineate what this spasm type symptom is that they're having. And there's a lot of different things that can cause that. So usually I need to do an upper endoscopy with esophageal biopsies to make sure it's not an atypical presentation of EOE. In addition, we'll often do pH reflux testing because acid reflux alone can present a spasm pain, which is kind of an atypical form, but it is possible. And then way down the list is true motility disorder, distal esophageal spasm, where we see spasm on a high-resolution esophageal manometry study. And if you really find that, you need to send the patient to me or one of my colleagues, because it's very rare. It's less than 1% of all manometry studies. So pain that feels like spasm, very common. We all see it all the time. Whether it's really distal esophageal spasm, very unlikely look for reflux. That's usually the biggie. And three-month trial of PPI, let's say we have that three-month window before they're going to see you and uh, they're having some dysphagia. Uh, Is a PPI trial uh, often often like a reasonable thing to do just like, and, and is three months too long or too short? What do you think about that? Yeah. Usually we say about eight to 12 weeks for a PPI trial. If you have high pretest suspicion for EOE, we have to be a little careful with the PPI trial because 40% of those patients will respond to the PPI. So by the time you do the endoscope, it may be normal and we Mm. won't know if they ever had EOE or not. So Mm. I, I actually am in the business often of peeling off medicines for people and then objectively defining, do they have EOE? As long as I'm not worried about them having a food impaction or something in the meantime. So, um, often I'll have to take them off medicines and that's another important point we can talk about. I, I, we do see a lot of patients where they get the kitchen sink thrown at them with EOE. They're on a PPI, they're on some kind of topical sol- swallowed steroid and some form of a non-systematic diet elimination. <laughs> so they come to me on all three. So I have to peel everything back, scope their native esophagus, get accurate scoring systems where we look for all those EOE features, meaning the rings, the furrow train tracks, the swelling, the exudates. Get the eosinophil counts. We consider it, as many of you know, above 15 eosinophils is abnormal. And then I figure out what line of treatment I want to go on because we like to streamline to one treatment if we can. The one caveat to that is there is a high overlap between EOE and reflux. Sometimes EOE is secondary to reflux. The initial mucosal hit that the patient gets is reflux damaging their mucosal barrier, and then the EOE food antigens go in and create the allergic response. So in that situation, if the PPI isn't going to put them in histologic and symptomatic remission for EOE and control reflux, then I have to have them on two therapies, one for EOE and then a low-dose PPI for reflux. Paul, you know, you, do you know what they call the, the EOE rings? I see, I see you have a, a friend recording with you there, so I thought you'd enjoy this. <laughs> Don't tell me. You're dying to say. I, I think they call them a feline esophagus, right? Isn't that like one of the things? Because it looks like the rings on a cat's tail, Paul. Mm. I thought of you when I was reading that. I that. Paul's going to love that. Yeah, because and he's holding. He's, he has his cat yes, in his lap present. right now. <laughs> um, all right, Elena. What what is next here for okay. for Quinn? Yeah. So Quinn gets an EGD, and as many of us might have suspected, she has some esophageal rings and pathology of her distal esophagus shows increased epithelial eosinophils with a peak of 100 eosinophils per high power field. Overall findings consistent with eosinophilic esophagitis. She is started on topical steroids and her symptoms improve. So I think very quickly, just to recap, um, I know we've talked a lot about EOE, but is there anything else needed beyond the pathology to make the diagnosis or is that uh, enough? So it's a clinical pathologic diagnosis. So they have to have the symptoms. So they need to have dysphagia. In addition, they need to have endoscopic findings. So we have a scoring system that you may see, the endoscopic reference score when you get the reports from us. And so that's where we're looking at the rings, furrows, edema, exudates, and strictures. And then in addition, histologic confirmation. So more than 15 eosinophils from the lower and mid or upper esophagus. And you told us that, you know, prior asthma, food allergies, ATP, those are things that would maybe key you in 
on this. So people that tell, give you a history of food impaction or just anyone who doesn't respond to a PPI, uh, are there any other like things you listen for in a history that make you think of that um, besides any other high yield ones for us to think about? Yep. Young food impaction, chasing meals with liquids, last to okay. leave the table. Those are all important okay. ones to think about. All right. And so we treat this patient. She feels better. We are conquering heroes. What what kind of follow-up is there at this point? Are we done with the patient or do they need kind of serial monitoring or sort of what do we do from here after they're feeling better? Yeah, critical question. So I'm glad the symptoms are better, but we're not done there. So whenever you initiate treatment for EOE or change treatment, you need to define histologic response. So she has 100 eosinophils. So we need to see if we can get them below 15 or at least close. And so a repeat endoscopy with biopsies. So it depends. So in this case, topical steroids. So most of us, when we put our patients on topical steroids, we'll start at a higher dose. And so that's to get induction into remission. And then after eight or 12 weeks, repeat endoscopy with biopsies to make sure the eosinophils are under 15. Getting patients into remission is in a lot of our guidelines. What to do once they're in remission and on maintenance we don't have any guidelines. It's all patient and provider dependent. Do we follow them with an esophagram in a year? Do we follow them with repeat biopsies? Do we just do a clinic visit? And you'll ask several GIs or esophagologists and we all have a different answer. And sometimes endoscopic features can be subtle. You can have very subtle mm -hmm. furrows or rings. And it's really important for us as GIs when we biopsy to target those, to look carefully and target them because EOE is patchy. So I could biopsy on the normal segment in between the line or the furrow and the eosinophils will be normal or under 15, and you won't know what's going on. So it's really a, a close, careful endoscopic look. But there are cases where a patient has dysphagia, they don't have clear endoscopic features, and they do have EOE. That's less common, but we do have a low threshold to biopsy, even if it looks normal, if our pretest probability is high. Or they may have a stricture. That may be the only feature you see. And it may not be reflux. A Schatzky ring or a stricture that looks like a peptic stricture may just be with EOE. Uh, Paul or Elena, any other, any other things with this first case that you wanted to, to go over? Not feeling good. No. Yeah. I okay. Think that. And, and I think some of the take homes were most people with dysphagia, I mean, dysphagia itself is an alarm symptom. So an EGD is warranted, but low threshold to get an esophagram. There's a lot of information you could potentially get from that. And the big buckets we talked about, there's like inflammatory that could be like an esophagitis from a pill or erosive esophagitis, EOE motility. Um, that's if the person's saying like dysphagia for liquids and solids, you think about that. And then uh, structural stuff is, is also in the differential. And uh, ultimately you have to take a look. You're not going to just diagnose it just by history, especially not where they point to, uh, which, <laughs> which is a shame, Paul. Yeah, Again, I know you're I'm, pulling for it. I'm lamenting over that one. <laughs> Perfect summary. So the next case, we have Jack, who is a 73-year-old gentleman coming in with history of coronary artery disease, hypertension, does have a history of GERD and recurrent falls. He has progressively worsening dysphagia. He describes difficulty swallowing while eating um, about five times per meal, and he feels like the food is getting back stuck in the back of his throat. And he does have symptoms of coughing after swallowing. Uh, he kind of points the level of his pharynx as the location of where food frequently gets stuck. So comparing Jack to Quinn uh, definitely has some more of those symptoms that we might associate with oropharyngeal dysphagia with the coughing and feeling like food is stuck as he's eating it very early. So what are some of the common etiologies that you would think about for this patient and any medications that might worsen oropharyngeal dysphagia as well? So the common buckets then for oral pharyngeal dysphagia, so we have the, sort of the structural ENT type issues. So particularly in older patients, they can have cricopharyngeal hypertrophy or bar. Sometimes they can have an outpouching there too, like a Zanker's diverticulum and malignancy if they're a smoker. Low threshold to send patients to ENT if they're a smoker. I have had patients that have come to me as the initial physician with dysphagia. They were a smoker. Remember on our endoscopy, we don't see the oropharynx well. We do everything we can to get through that area as fast as possible so we don't go <laughs> in the larynx, right? We're going right into the upper esophageal sphincter. We don't see any of that. So ENT with their laryngoscopy in clinic, they have found 
I've sent patients and they found squamous cancers for me, even ones that were missed outside by ENT. So I have a low threshold for that. Next bucket are neurologic issues. So common things being common, like this guy is high risk for stroke that can cause oral pharyngeal dysphagia. Other neurologic things like Parkinson's, myasthenia gravis, and then other uh, myopathies can do that as well. And then I think Elena had asked about medications too. Like, do you, like, uh, especially the ones with anticholinergic type side effects, I imagine would, you know, like anything that causes dry mouth would do it. Are there any other like big buckets or medications that we should ask about when someone presents like this? Yes, definitely. So one area I have to point out, because it's one of my areas of research and it's becoming more known is chronic opioids are a big trigger for dysphagia. So we all know about opioid induced constipation. Even our patients know about that. But now we've learned that opioids actually cause dysphagia, chest pain, heartburn, and they can cause esophageal motility problems, including certain types of spastic achalasia or type 3 achalasia. So that's really important to ask about. We're trying to study this more prospectively, but our retrospective data does show that potentially weaning the dose to reduce the morphine equivalents or weaning them off may help. But we don't have any reversal agents for opioid-induced esophageal dysfunction like we do for you know, opioid-induced constipation. And then the other things are what you alluded to, like tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, especially the TCAs with dry mouth that can really cause dysphagia. And then the other thing we always have to remember too is meds that cause pill esophagitis. So you have common things like NSAIDs or potassium pills, certain antibiotics, bisphosphonates, those all can cause dysphagia too from the pill esophagitis. Yeah, doxy is one of the antibiotics. Even though, even though it's my favorite, uh, <laughs> it's it's. Uh, I think it's one of the ones that can do that. Yep. Uh, I had no idea about the opioids. Uh, and is this? Are we seeing this in people on opioids for chronic pain, or is this like illicit, like fent- fentanyl use, uh, or all of the above? All of the above, but mainly chronic opioids prescribed. For pain. Respect. If they're on it, usually for at least three months, we've seen a higher rate with oxycodone, hydrocodone, mainly because it has higher morphine equivalent dosing. Tramadol, less likely what we've seen because it's weaker, um, but we are trying to study this more. So it's something that I'm trying to publicize more because your patients will yeah. come to you with dysphagia or reflux symptoms at some point on opioids. And they don't realize it's from the opioid because they're used to focusing on the constipation. So I do like to let people know that we're studying that. Yeah, because Paul, you're, I know you're doing a lot of addiction medicine, buprenorphine, and uh, are you seeing any of that? Or it, I guess maybe now you'll be peaked, you're, you know. Yeah, I'll probably be a little bit more diligent. I will say that in that space, there's, I, I, this is probably a side note that I don't know we need to include necessarily, but there's so much comorbid tobacco use that if someone would come to me with dysphagia, I, I probably would still... I'm not sure I would leap right to the opioid as a possible cause. I think I'd be more concerned about, you know, something squamous and probably still have them see ENT first. But so it's not, but it was nowhere on my radar. Now that we've kind of talked about what are some possible etiologies for Jack's dysphagia, what would be the next best step in evaluating uh, his difficulty swallowing? So like we, we talked about, and as you mentioned, he was having more difficulty transferring the food in his throat and he was coughing. So we're worried about oral pharyngeal dysphagia. So that's when you need to send the patient to the speech pathologist to do a what is either a modified barium slash video fluoroscopic swallow, so really the same thing, whatever, it's just a different name for it, um, to evaluate further what's going on. Because the endoscopy, as I mentioned, we can't see that area very well. And on esophagram, you can get some information about the cricopharyngeus, but you get better information with the focused swallow up top with the speech pathologist. Yeah. And so let's say Jack also doesn't have any smoking history. So we send him directly to speech therapy. Uh, He does get a a modified barium swallow. The results are really notable for one, silent aspiration with a large bolus of thin liquid and two, severe pharyngeal dysphagia marked by um, near absent pharyngeal stripping wave, which prevents full epiglottic inversion. So they recommend a modified diet and speech exercises and he is going to follow up with speech therapy. I think, you know, there's quite a few results in that. So is there anything that we should be more concerned about or that would require like additional evaluation or is going forward with speech therapy appropriate? So I'm definitely concerned about the aspiration. That's always mm-hmm. the most concerning thing that we can see. So basically his epiglottis isn't covering the larynx properly when he's swallowing. So that's why the barium's getting back and aspirating into the larynx. 
You'll also see other terms on there. Sometimes they'll use the term penetration versus aspiration. So penetration is basically just a little flash, a little flash of the bear. I'm going at the larynx, but aspiration is going all the way in. Um, so, so we definitely worry about aspiration. So being able to retrain the muscle motions there. And if it is from a stroke, usually over time, as well as the exercises that can improve, but trying to retrain the muscles there because we don't want them to have an aspiration pneumonia is important. And it's important to work with your speech pathologist, but also a dietitian, because typically it's not exercises in isolation. They need to do the strengthening exercises. They also need to do certain chin tuck and maneuvers to help protect the airway. And in addition, modifying the consistencies of food and liquids to those that the speech pathologist can see are less likely to go into the larynx. This may trigger some of our geriatric geriatrician. <laughs> yeah, I was listeners. worried about that. Yeah. No, we we uh have you seen like the the UCSF uh geriatrician group, uh Eric Wadera and his friends, they they did like a thick and liquid challenge for uh the geriatricians that were prescribing thick and li- liquids to a lot of their patients, but uh uh, but uh, the one thing he was a fan of though was the pu- i think it was the puree paul right it's like a I, it's some sort of one of the one of the modified diets he said is actually quite delicious which it's, I, I think I, it was the puree i think that's right i can't remember if we had talked about this in the episode or not but you know i used to work in nursing home kitchens for like a decade before actually going to a career in medicine and i i prided myself on the quality of my pureed foods so it's I, that that <laughs> sounds right to me <laughs> they've got little molds and things too so you can like if you're serving fish you can actually eat like it's in the shape of a fish even though it's all pureed Aww. up so it's a lot of, a lot of great options um <laughs> for texture modification if you're interested in that yeah. kind of thing. They help with pills too. Like I mentioned earlier, we're not designed to swallow pills or capsules or things mm-hmm. of that shape. Have them put their pill in applesauce and it really spreads the pharynx and the pharyngeal tissue nicely and it's much easier mm-hmm. for them to swallow it. Yeah, with in primary care, metformin, uh, the higher the higher tablet strength metformin is one of the ones I've had a lot of patients complain about and sometimes potassium tablets Classically, too. I was going to say potassium is invariably complained about as a gigantic yeah. pill. Yep, that's yeah, that's a big one. I, I do feel like I see a fair amount of people that just like they have some chronic swallowing dysfunction, but they're not losing weight. There's no major alarm symptoms, and they seem to be just like getting by. Um, I'm not sure. I always send every single person to where sometimes people just seem to have these transient complaints of dysphagia, and then they'll be like a few months later, they'll be like, "Oh no, it's it's better now." <laughs> um, I don't know, Paul, if you if you seem to see that too, but 100%. it's not like every person that tells me they have dysphagia is getting an EGD. Uh, it just, it just doesn't happen because it's, it's such a common complaint if you're seeing them in primary care. So I hope that's okay, Diana. Yeah, I, it's okay. I see that too. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it goes away. I mean, even all of us, let's presume the four of us have normal swallowing. If you eat a giant hamburger and I don't chew it well, you know, you get that tight thing stuck in there every mm. once in a while. We all do that. And sometimes patients tell us about that because they're hypervigilant and want us to know. Right. But I really Maybe tease through it, it. And if it went away, it was one time and they don't have alarm symptoms. It's fine. It, that happens. So it's okay that you're not sending everyone for testing. Yeah. Okay. So the weight loss, bleeding, recurrent aspiration, pneumonia, you told us those are, those are definite ones that we should, we should think about. Um, so Elena, what else? I know we're kind of coming coming towards the end. Are we are we doing anything else for for Jack, our seventy three year old man here? No, Jack goes. He gets some exercises and does pretty well overall. And feels like the coughing is improving, and that was really his biggest concern too. Uh, and so I think the only other question I had, and we did kind of touch on this, but. Speaking of patients who maybe have this dysphagia and then they get an EGD and it's normal and they come back to primary care, when is it helpful to think about then getting a motility study or like which of those patients should you send back for a motility evaluation? Yeah. So if the endoscopy is normal and they're having the solid and liquid dysphagia, then I would say you should get the manometry. If they're not having liquid dysphagia, the likelihood it's a motility issue is unlikely. And again, you can rule out achalasia pretty well on an esophagram. So you should be able to Mm -hmm. see dilation of the esophagus and a a narrowing at the lower esophageal sphincter. The gold standard is still manometry to diagnose it, but you can pretty well exclude it with the esophagram if they're not having liquid dysphagia. So that's usually what what I would do for that. Uh, Paul, fun fact that I was reading about achalasia... (laughs) Apparently, they have trouble belching. Diana, is that because the upper esophageal sphincter is just also tight and just not 
um, they, they just can't get the air out once it's in there? Yeah, we don't really understand those mechanisms very well. I ha- I do see that sometimes. We don't see it quite as often with achalasia. I mean, the ones that we really see it with are the patients that come to me that had anti-reflux surgery. Those are the ones that really can't belch because they had a fund application, right? So their stomach cardia is wrapped up tightly, mm-hmm. and so they can't release the air. So they have a hard time belching. From their stomach. Yeah, from their stomach. Um so with achalasia, they can still technically belch, but I have seen a little bit of what you're talking about, but we don't really understand all those mechanisms because we still don't understand the etiology of achalasia as well. Okay. If my patients can't belch, I'm going to send them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's I, good I, I, <laughs> that we spent a couple of minutes discussing belching specifically of this incredibly rare condition that we're probably not going to make the diagnosis for. <laughs> yeah, so belching's tricky. <laughs> and remember, there's gastric belching and there's super gastric. And so they're either, you know air swallowing and then releasing it, that's super gastric versus gastric, which is physiologic. They should be belching because the fundus should be venting the stomach fundus. So if you're not sure about that, just send them to us because we can do impedance testing to figure out what kind of belching it is. And if it's super gastric, we do uh, basically psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and diaphragmatic breathing. So those nuances, send them over to us. But when in doubt, diaphragmatic breathing treats a lot of esophageal issues. It treats reflux too, because it helps you contract the diaphragm and keep reflux down. So I think unless Paul and Elena have other questions, I think we're ready to get some take-home points on this. Uh, Paul, Elena, last chance, any, any favorite questions you wanted to ask or like sneezing in the yourself like esophagitis or <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'm good. Thank you. All right. So Diana, can you give us a couple favorite take-home points for the listeners uh, from what we talked about this evening? So first, when you ask them about your swallow, their swallowing, just start open-ended. So when they come to see me, I ask, what brought you to come see me? Why are you being referred? And then I'll ask them, tell me about your swallowing. Sometimes in that clip of one minute of what they tell you in a nice, concise story, you actually get a lot of the info. Then I'll go into the granular details we talked about. Is it solids, liquids, pills, multiple things? Is it progressive? Is it intermittent? And are they having alarm symptoms like weight loss, bleeding, aspiration, pneumonia? And then we keep hammering this home, but ask about questions for EOE. Are they compensating? Are they chasing with liquids, last to leave the table? Do they have atopic overlap conditions? It's just very good to hit things that are are common. And EOE is very common, like we talked about. So it's it's something to really make sure that we're not missing. Do you have uh, anything that you would like to plug? Any websites, resources uh, related to, to dysphagia or any work you're doing that you wanted to just make the audience aware of? We have a program at Mayo that's pretty unique. It's a self-dilation program. I'm one of the directors of it. So if you have any patients where they're getting endoscopy after endoscopy after endoscopy for refractory strictures, usually patients that had radiation or the biggies, especially the head and neck cancers, send them to me because we can teach them how to sword swallow, essentially. I teach them how to pass a bougie dilator in and out one second in the morning. Then they don't have to get an endoscopy sometimes ever again, sometimes maybe in a year instead of every week. And then I have these patients that survived cancer and now they can have their spaghetti and meatballs who are on a feeding tube before. So any refractory strictures, send them our way. Oh my gosh, these people must love you. Yeah. They're, they're able- <laughs> it's one of the uh, most rewarding parts of my practice. They go from a cancer patient on a feeding tube to eating what they want. So it's initially scary for them, right? It's mind over matter, learning how to pass a tube through their mouth while they're awake. But when they learn and realize how easy they do it in the morning when they brush their teeth, it's in and out. And they're so grateful. It's a really important part of our practice. Do you usually- I do have one more question. Oh, go ahead, <laughs> Now I'm just wondering, like, is this accomplished in one clinic visit? Like, it's pretty fast to teach them? or So the, we have a video that they watch ahead, and then they uh-huh. meet with my nurse and they meet with me. We have dedicated esophagus nurses that help teach them. Um, so, yeah, and basically over a video and two brief sessions, we can get 99% of patients to do it. It's very rare for us to not be able to. Limitations are more anatomic if, if I don't think they're a candidate ahead of time when I see the mm-hmm. outside endoscopy. But in terms of the willingness of the patient, if they're motivated, I can teach them to do it 99% of the time. As an esophagologist, as our expert, it, it's, it sounds like it's dysphagia, not dysphagia. I just, I feel like that's something that I've debated with for years now. Have I been mispronouncing <laughs> the entire time? <laughs> I don't know if there's different regional dialects. I'm from Chicago, so I have a little bit of a Chicago accent, but I say dysphagia 
That's what I think most people say, but it's not wrong for you to say dysphagia. Yeah. It sounds more elegant, doesn't it? I mean, it, what it you're does. talking to. Yeah, that's right. And you're from New York, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. I th- I, this is a great place to end. Uh, thank you so much, Diana, <laughs> yeah, for you. all your time and teaching. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> a little bit more conviction than usual, <laughs> Gibson. Still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all episodes ad-free, plus twice-monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find show notes at curbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That includes our Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we want your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. You can also send an email to askcurbsiders at gmail.com. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME credit through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And I wanted to give a special thanks to Dr. Elena Gibson for helping to write and produce this episode. And our technical production is done by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media and Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. Uh, And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Wado. Elena Gibson here. It always delights me. I don't know why. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Thank you and goodbye. 